anybody else? Oh, wow. What a blessing, man. That's a long way from uh, the first few hours. But, yeah. Yes. I know Oliver's requested prayer. I don't know what they got going on. I mean, anytime that you have a new church starts, I mean, Satan is just, I mean, he attacks, attacks, attacks. And I, I know that uh, I think they were going to their, our partners in Utah and Montana, and I have no idea. He hasn't told me, but he just requested prayer. I texted him last night about it. I didn't know whether he was going to be back or not. And he said, man, just pray for us. Pray for us to last night and tomorrow. So whatever's going on up there, we just need to lift that up. So let's go to the Lord. Lord, we do come to you this morning praising you and thanking you. And God, I pray you, you would uh, forgive us for we've fallen short. You might hear and answer our prayers. And Lord, there's been several mentioned here today that really need a touch from you. Physical issues, Lord, uh, healing, uh, restoration, uh, all of those things, God. And Lord, we know that there are others uh, unmentioned, Lord. Uh, there's th folks that are grieving and uh, have decisions to make. Uh, there's folks that are uh, bound by sin, Lord. We just we just lift all everybody in this room, God. Whatever they have going on, we lift it up to you, Lord. We lift Oliver as whoever's with him up there, God. That your spirit, Lord, would be with them, and Lord, you would dispatch powerful angels, Lord God, to take care of the demonic forces as they're up against wherever they may be coming from. And Lord, we ask you be with us in time. We thank you for this word that you've given us. Give me the ability to deliver it in a way that's pleasing to you. And would impact all of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're continuing on in our uh, study of Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians 4. And uh, kind of, again, we're, 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 we're going along this theme of uh, Paul trying to t tell these folks that uh, you uh, stay saved the way you got saved in the first place. And, uh, and it's a battle that we all face. And I've got written up here on four flesh versus faith. And we'll, we'll kind of look at that through that lens today. We're going to be getting into some uh, Old Testament passages. And uh, because God, I must tell you, we, we serve an amazing and mighty God. And he, he uses events in history and people's lives <clears throat> Uh, to make a point. And, uh, and let me just say this up front. Uh, there are those that believe that God um, orchestrates everything. Uh, that th This is called, uh, the theological term is called uh, determinism. And so there are many Christians that believe that if it happens... It's because God made it happen. You Calvinists believe this. You John MacArthur's, you John Piper's, your Bodie Bauckham's, your those kinds of guys. Great guys, love them, listen to them, preach. They believe in determinism. And so, and so the problem with that is you make God the author of evil. Because if somebody gets raped, well, that was God's will. That don't make no sense to me when you read the Word of God. But there's a lot of people, and that, and so that 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 plays into this mentality of it was meant to be. Now, a lot of people live by it was a meant to be situation. Uh, but but we, our God, gives His children mankind free will. But that doesn't mean He doesn't intervene in our lives uh, to accomplish His goals. But he does that, he does not violate your free will by doing that. Now some people will say, well how can that be? How can, how can God uh, uh, intervene in our lives in such a way that we do something, but it's our own choice? Well, when you don't limit God to what he can do, that's an easy answer. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, this is this passage, many of you know it, you need to know it, if you don't know it, memorize it. 
There's no temptation taking you, but it's common to man, but God is faithful and just with every temptation to provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear up under it. Now, you got to think about the implications of that scripture. That means God knows exactly what you can and can't take. See, all of us have a breaking point. Every single one of us in here, God knows exactly what you couldn't take to give in to temptation. Regardless of what the temptation is, whether it's sexual or money or turn your back on him or whatever it might be, he knows your breaking point, and you got one. And some people's breaking point is higher tolerated than others. But he gives you a promise. He will not allow you to be tempted above your able to bear. That means he is directly, divinely intervening in your life all the time. That's where that old thing, God will never give you more than... Yeah, and that's a misquote of that. Yeah, absolutely. Because God will give you more than you can handle. He's going to always give you more than you handle because you've got to rely on him. Mm -hmm. What he won't do is allow you to be tempted beyond your able to bear. And so that tells us that God intervenes in people's lives, Christians, non-Christians' lives all the time. How he does that? He does that through his sovereignty. He manipulates circumstances. But he'll never, he will never violate your free will. But if he can, if he can change the circumstances that you will not be tempted above your able, he can change the circumstances that he knows what it would take to get you to choose something as well. Now, you might say, well, that's an underhanded way to do it, but no, it's not. You still are making a free will choice given the circumstances that he's allowed to put around you. And so that's how God can, can intervene in our lives and accomplish his purpose and his will. But, here, but here's the thing. Uh, and and you, you, look, you can feel free to disagree with me because probably most people do. Uh, God, I think God has a plan and a purpose for all of our lives and it's sitting there, and it's laid out, and you can choose it or not choose it. And so, and so we, we have an infinite number of choices every day. And so God's got a plan and a purpose right now as I'm standing here talking to you, and you know in less than a minute I may, vial, I may get off the path. And he ain't going to take me back to the path. He's got a new path. And so, so God, it's, it, you've got endless paths. It all based on your choices. And so let's say God's will for my life was for me to walk through that door right now because something is waiting for me on the other side. And I take a couple of steps toward it and I get distracted and I say, hmm, man, I think I need to go over here. Well, my plan changed. It's no longer to go out that door. It's to go somewhere else. And I hope you can get your mind wrapped around that. And so the reason I'm saying all that is this, that these things we're going to read in the Old Testament really happened. There are real people that lived real lives and made real choices, and yet God uses them to show us the way. Uh, any questions on that? Oh, it's a little deep there. Greg, I used to tell my son as he was growing up, your choices are your choices, but so are the consequences that go with them. Absolutely. I can't make you choose right or wrong. But whenever you choose right or wrong, the consequences that go with them are all on you. I can't. I can, as a parent, love you and teach you, but I can't live out your life for you. Yep. And that's the same way with us with God. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and here's a couple of things that I try to live by, pass it on to anybody that wants some counsel. Uh, you can never go wrong doing the right thing. No matter what kind of circumstance you've got yourself in, how bad it is. Here's what we do. We get ourselves in terrible circumstances through choices we make in our flesh. And, and man, they're bad. And so then we start thinking about how do we get out of that using the flesh. So no matter how, how bad, bad of a pit you are, God has got a plan. And he can take you. This is what we get. Well, what if you make a mistake in who you marry? Or what if you make a mistake in what job you take? Or whatever. And you, so you're sitting there and you think, I have messed my life up completely. God's got a plan. From the point you're standing at, wherever it is, he's got a new plan. And that's the great thing about God. He's got a new plan. He's got a new plan. He's got a new plan. And so if you get off the path, hey, he probably the plan he had was going to be a whole lot better than you're on now. But the, one, the, the best plan forward is the one God's plan for your life, if that makes any sense at all. So anyway, I don't know why I got into all that. Let's get into our text. <laughs> We're going to be in Galatians uh, 4.1. I'm going to 
I'm going to read through 1 through 7. Now, or somebody else, read 1 through 7. 4, 1 through 7. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. Right? Wait, wait, wait. Am I in the wrong spot? Oh, wait. I'm flipped over. I'm sorry. Chapter 4. Oh, yeah. I was right there. Maybe <laughs> messed me up. <laughs> um, now I say that the heir is that it? Yep. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. All right. So the question is, what changes when we come out from under the law through faith in Christ? Well, let's back up a, just a, a, to, to, to give context to what he just read. It says in, up there in verse uh, th uh, chapter 3, 26, above that, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So, so what happens to us whenever we are born again, we become a child of God. See, before you're born again, you're a child of Adam. And, 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 so, and so this is something that actually happens. It changes. It's supernatural. You're born again. You have, your spirit is made alive, and you actually become a child of God. See, lost people are not children of God. See, that, that's, that's what the world would have you believe, that we're all children of God. No, we're not all children of God. The only people that are children of God, the only people that are children of God is Adam and Eve and the angels. And born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the only children of God. They're the only sons of God. And so, and so uh, uh, that's what happens to us uh, whenever we are born again. So all of those people in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, Abraham and all those guys, not children of God. They're not born again. They're not in the body of Christ. And so what, that's, what, that's the context. And so he's saying, okay, now that you're born again, what do you become? You become an heir, right? So it is uh, children of Adam, you're under the law, but when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're no longer under the law. You're, you're under you're grace. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you're under grace. And, that, and that's the whole point of Paul writing this. Thing. These people are born again, they're saved, and they want to go back under the law. And, and, and because what they want to do, what they've been told is that uh, you can lose your salvation if you don't follow the law. Okay, then you know, okay, good. You put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again, but you're going to lose your salvation if you don't follow the law, get circumcised, and do all of these things. And Paul's trying to tell them look, no, you are a child of God now, and you're an heir, and you don't, uh, you're not kept righteous. And he says, uh, uh, that a child is, is, is a, as a slave, though he's master of all, of all, but is under guardians and stewards to the point of the time of the father. And so, so what we have here is they had the law. Remember, we, we heard that the law was their guardian, right? Their schoolmaster, their teacher. Uh, and at the point in time is when? When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because the whole law is pointing toward Jesus. That's the point of the law. And that's just what Paul's banging his head against the wall with these folks because they're trying to go back under the law to, to, to maintain their relationship with God. All right, verse 8. But indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather known by God, how is it? that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. You observe week days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you lest I have labored in vain. And so the question is, first of all, 
I didn't put this in your deal. Let me see. Psalm 82. Psalm 82. You think God's the only God? That's a trick question. Let's read Psalm. I'm going to read Psalm 82. You don't have to turn to it. I'm going to read Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. With a G. Little G. So you've got the heavenly host. They're called gods. They're small gods. They're not the God. They're not Yahweh. And so this is talking about in heaven, he is uh, standing among the congregation of all these celestial beings. He judges uh, among the gods. How, how long will you just un, uh, judge unjustly? What's he talking about? He's talking about these angels that he's given charge over geographical locations on this earth. And they have corrupted mankind. And, he, and he's going to go on to excoriate. But I wanted you to see here the G little gods. He judges among the gods. Because the question here is, what do the Gentiles worship before they came to faith in Jesus? Somebody read 1 Corinthians 10, 20. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Demons. That's who Gentiles worship is demons. Uh, and they come in all different names and characters and all of those things. And, I mean, you can read several of them in the Bible. And uh, they're the same things that people worship today is demons. And, and so uh, all religions, if you're worshiping a demon, have rules and regulations, right? Now, they differ depending on the religion. But they say if you're going to get to whatever their version of heaven is, you got to follow the prescription of the religion you're into. Whether it's Islam or uh, Confucianism or Buddhism or Hinduism or, or name your ism. They all have got a prescribed way that you get to eternal life. And the only way you do it is if you follow whatever their religion prescribes. But it's demons. It's demons. You know, remember Paul said, uh, in the last days, uh, the, the Christian people follow the doctrines of demons. So they worship demons. And there's rules and regulations, depending on which religion they have, that's going to get them what they, that they think is going to get them where they want to go when they die. But then what about the Jews? Uh, well, uh, let's read, uh, somebody read Colossians 2, 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, if you're living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not touch, do not handle, which all concern these things, concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments of the doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So here you have these the, the Gentiles worship demons. <coughs> what did Jews worship? They worship the law. They didn't worship God, they worship the law. That's the, the, the passage I was looking up, the, trying to find uh, that I just remembered about this morning. Uh, John 5. This is what Jesus says. He's talking to these Jews. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. See, these Jews think they have eternal life because they have the scriptures, they have the law. But then he goes on to say, and these, they which testify of me. So the very thing that the Jews think is going to save them, which is the law of Moses, is the very thing that's telling them about Jesus. And they're rejecting Jesus and worshiping their law. And the law, just like, and this is what the uh, uh, 
uh, that number three says, what did Jews and Gentiles have in common? How they tried to relate to God. They tried to relate to God through doing whatever it is they, the religion told them they needed to do. I don't know what all these Gentiles were having to do. I mean, they were sacrificing and going and fornicating at the temple and doing all of these things. And then the Jews, they're trying to follow the law of Moses and they're eat, keeping kosher, not eating pork and shellfish and not working on Saturday and blah, 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 blah. It's all about they're going to be uh, righteous based on what they do. That's, that's the whole deal. That is flesh versus faith. Lost Gentiles that were worshiping demons and lost Jews that are worshiping the law, it's all about what can they do. It is all based on if they have the right sacrifice, if they live the right way, if they follow the right rules, if they follow the right regulation, they're going to be squared away with God. And Jesus is trying to tell them, and Paul is trying to tell them, that's not what squares you with God. It's faith that squares you with God. And so they're all in the same boat. All human beings are in the same boat apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not going to get there on their own. You know, most people in this country think you just follow the golden rule. You just follow the golden rule. Be a good person. Be a good citizen. Uh, you know, be constructive. Build people up. Love your neighbor. Feed, you know, feed them. Clothe them. And do all those things. Person ought to do all those things, but that's got nothing to do with making you right before God or getting you into heaven or anywhere. It's got nothing to do with it. And so, so people are basing their 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 salvation on what do they do, and then these Gentiles, they're a little. I mean, these Galatians are a little different. They are saved, and now they're trying to say stay saved based on what they did. There's not a whole lot of difference in that. We need to do all those things. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves, and we need to, to clothe folks and feed folks and minister to people and do the right thing because Jesus is holy. And he says, be holy for I am holy. We do it because of what he did for us, not so that we can stay in his favor. The only way we stay in the favor of God is shed blood of Jesus Christ because you're wicked, and I am too. Because you know what you've been thinking about for the last 48 hours. You know the things crossed your mind that weren't right. And so we got this flesh we're living in. And so we got to continue to rely on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that is keeping us squared with God. Somebody read verse 12 through 16. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of the physical infirmity, I preach the gospel to you as the first. Is it 14 you said? Uh, 16. Okay. In my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? All right, so Paul gives a little insight into his relationship uh, with, with these Galatians. Now, uh, it's speculated that Paul, so you, do you remember, which I should have gone back to the passage. I did. Let me tell you what happened. God took Paul up to heaven, to the third heaven, to God's throne. And Paul says uh, that he doesn't know whether he was physically in the body or in the spirit. He, got, he didn't know, but it was, it was real. It really happened. And it said he saw things that he, it, it would be forbidden to share. Because there's things going on in the third heaven that we don't, we're not privy to. And, and, and can you imagine if you got called up into heaven and you know that you're one of three guys, I guess, in the Bible, I don't know, four, that have had that. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, right? That would that'd puff you up pretty good. And the things that he saw and the revelations that God gave him were so magnificent that the Word of God said that, that, that God gave him a messenger of Satan in his flesh to keep him rooted and grounded, to keep him from 
getting so conceited with what he knew, the knowledge he had, and his position and all that. And the word says Paul begged the Lord three times to take it away, and he wouldn't do it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so uh, it's not conclusive, but the speculation based on what we see in Paul's writings, it has something to do with his eyes. Now, he had a problem with his eyes. Whether that was the messenger of Satan or not, we don't know. But he had a problem with his eyes. And, and, uh, and so what he's saying in these Galatians, and it must have been pretty severe because it was a burden to them. And, and, and they accepted him and loved him and dealt with him and ministered to him as he ministered to them. And they had this special relationship. And, uh, and it was a mutual respect and love and desire. And then what did they do after he left? These false teachers come in and they start listening to them instead of what Paul taught them. And so then he's writing them this stern letter and he says there at the end, he says... Uh, uh, therefore, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He's trying to remind them, hey, remember what it was like when I was here in the flag and the person? And we were spending all this time together and y'all believed what I was saying and now you're rejecting what I'm saying. He said, I'm just telling you the truth and I'm not your enemy. Sometimes the truth hurts, right? That's why, that's why you don't, it's not always, you're not always trying to make somebody feel good. That's what we do today. We don't hurt anybody's feelings. Well, you know what? Sometimes their feelings need to be hurt if it's the truth that's going to hurt them. And that's all Paul's saying. Hey, look, this is a harsh letter, and I'm getting on to y'all, but I, I'm not doing it because I'm your enemy. I'm doing it because I love you. All right. Verse 17. Verse 17. They zealously, the they here is these false teachers, they zealously court you, but not for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you, uh, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and change my tone for I have for I have doubts about you. And so what we have going on here is so what would they be excluded from? Any idea? If the Galatians continue to follow the false teachers which say you gotta follow the law of Moses, what would they excluded from? Anybody got a guess? Hmm? Fellowship with God. That's a big one. Absolutely. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah, they're in bondage. They're, they're, so they're excluded from fellowship with God. They're excluded from uh, freedom. And they're excluded from inheritance. Let me tell you something. These Christians, these born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that spend their life banging their head against the wall trying to do right things to stay safe, guess what? They're going to be empty-handed at the judgment seat of Christ. Because what's their motivation for the good that they did? It's to save themselves. You think they're going to get any reward for that? I don't care how much good they did. I don't care how many churches they started. I don't care how many people they fed or clothed or whatever. If their motivation was, i got to do this to keep from going to hell, there's no reward for that. They're excluded from that. And so what Paul's trying to tell them is, look, these, if you go after these teachers... And you get, and they, they want you to follow them, then you're going to exclude yourself from all of these things that God has for his children. Fellowship with God. Freedom and liberty in God. Reward at the end. You'll be excluded from all that because you follow this false teaching. And he doesn't want that. And he's, look, he says, uh, I, my, my little children in whom I labor and birth and kill... Again, until Christ is formed in you. Now, what does that mean? Formed in us. See, our salvation is uh, is about what what's going to happen when we stand before Almighty God the judgment, and we're going to be saved. We're not our sins are not going to be counted against us. But our life in Christ is a lifelong journey, right? To become like Jesus. You heard the theological word sanctification. That is to become like Christ. That's what we all need to be doing. That's why y'all are in this class right now and studying the Word of God so you can become more like Jesus. Yep. In the sense that we'll be His image, right? That's right. But we've got to we got to allow Him to work in us to do that. 
and it takes work. And you gotta you gotta have a desire. Cause you know what? There's the vast majority of Christians just just uh, they're saved, and you know they're gonna go to heaven and they're gonna live the rest of their life for themselves and their kids. And you know they might live good lives and and, and do this and that, but they're 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 not they're not doing anything for Lord Jesus Christ. They're not building them any reward in heaven. They're not expanding His kingdom. Look, we need to be winning souls to Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking about that the other day. I, I think we need in this class, we need to, we need to do, spend a little time at some point in the future of how to win souls. You're supposed to be winning souls for Jesus and, 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 and doing those things. And so uh, Christ formed in us, it is maturity. It is maturity in Christ. It, 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 and it takes time and it takes effort. And there's a lot of baby Christians that's known the Lord 40, 50 years. They never matured. They're going to go to heaven, but they never got in the Word. They never studied. They never grew. They never served. They never did anything. And, and they may have lived peaceful lives and raised some good kids and had a good time and, and, and all of that. But that's not all that we're here for. We, we need to mature in Christ. And so here's the thing. If you get sidetracked on some false teaching, like following uh, the law of Moses, you're never going to mature. And... Uh, and there's a lot of that going on today. That's why some Christians give up because we cannot, we cannot follow the law and, and do it. We just can't. You're exactly right. You're going to get defeated, defeated, and then you're just going to say, forget it. And you forget what God's promise is. Nothing can separate us from his love. Yeah. Even when I mess up, he still loves me. That's right. And that's just a satanic point. you got to remember the, the enemy of your soul, the devil. Once you're born again, he cannot have your soul. It's done. All he can do then is absolutely wreck your life and prevent you from bringing anybody else along to find the Lord. That's all he can do, and he'll do it, and he's good at it. And that's why we got to mature in the Lord. All right, let me see. Here we go. Uh, 20. Here's where we're going to get into some Old Testament uh, allegory here. Uh, 21. This is uh, 421. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondwoman and the other by the free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise, which things are symbolic. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to the bondage, which is Hagar. For this is Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with our children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has become, the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise, but as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so now, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, if you haven't read your Old Testament, that makes absolutely no sense to you, okay? And so I'm not going to assume we all figure, uh, read all of that and know what he's talking about, because, man, he brings up several different things in the Old Testament that are seemingly unrelated. Look, first he starts talking about Abraham. No, oh, the first thing he talks about is the law. This is Moses. That's after Abraham. And then he talks about Abraham had two sons. And, and, and then he brings him back into Mount Sinai. That's where God's talking to Moses. And, and so he's going back and forth. There. And then he brings Jerusalem into the picture. Okay. So we got to kind of do some clearing up on this. 
And so we're going to read some Old Testament passages to figure out what he's talking about. <laughs> Genesis chapter 16. Turn to Genesis 16. Keep a finger of your deal back in Galatians. We're going to be over here in Genesis for a little bit. Genesis 16, 1. Okay, so remember before we start reading this that God has promised that uh, Abraham, he's going to give him all this land and his descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, sky sand in the sea. All of these promises he gave to Abraham. But Abraham's old, man. He's old. And his wife is old. Be way beyond childbearing age. And so the, the word of God says that Abraham believed God and it was credited him as righteous. He believed that he, these things were going to happen, but he didn't have a clue how they were going to happen. Okay. So all of these promises were made to Abraham way before what we're fixing to read. And so remember, they're old. He, the, the promises were made when he was old, and now he's even older than he was. So let somebody read 16, 1 through 5. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Okay. So here we have the situation. So God made these promises to Abraham. He was an old man. Ten years passed. He still doesn't have no kid. And Sarah's getting impatient. And she's like, well, so we got to do something here. I'm, I'm way too old to have a kid. And so she's going to help God out. And so she gives her, her servant, her maid, to her husband to be a wife and to have a kid. And she did. So that's what we saw right there. Now, so this is the bond woman that is talk, uh, that, that Paul was talking about in Galatians. And so now let's flip to 17, uh, 1715, and somebody read uh, 1715 through 22. Then God said to Abram, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall become a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I, will, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. For my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So here we have God is going to fulfill his plan and his purpose through Sarah, which he intended to to begin with. Now notice something right here. Now, now the Ishmael is the, the, the child we're talking about here, the descendants of the Arabs and all those over there. And, so, and they've been at war. They've been at war since this time. And so uh, listen to what it says. He says here, uh, after God uh, tells him what's going to happen, what did Abraham do? He said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. 
So he had this boy. He loved that child. It was his firstborn son. And he wanted God to use Ishmael. And God said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And, 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 and why do you think that is? How was Ishmael born? By the flesh, right? It was their idea, and if they did it. And there wasn't anything unusual about that. He had sex with her. And she got pregnant. And they had a kid. That's what everybody does. That was their culture. They had to have an heir in order to pass on. Yeah. And, yes. yeah. And, and so God's like, I, don't have, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was your doing. What I'm going to do is miraculous. I, what I'm going to do is miraculous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you and Sarah, which are beyond childbearing years, have a child. A child of promise. See, God promised Abraham he was going to have a kid. It was not Ishmael. It was not through the bondwoman. It was through Sarah. That was his promise. Like Ishmael represents flesh and Isaac represents faith. Absolutely. You're right. He wasn't a child of God either. That's right. Mm -hmm. And even though he blessed him, I mean, you look at all the trouble that they've had with Ishmael just all throughout the whole. All right, let's now go to uh, 21, Genesis 21. <clears throat> I'll read this one, 1 through 12, while I'm already. And the Lord visited Sarah and said, uh, and, and he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah had conceived and bore Abraham a son in his, in his old age. At the set time which God had spoken him, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, and Sarah bore to him Isaac. And then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Whew. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. And she also said, uh, who would have said Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And here it is, here it is verse 8. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, this is Ishmael, the Egyptian, whom she had bore to Abraham scoffing. Therefore, uh, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So see, Abraham's still not on the page with the Lord. He still wants Ishmael to be a part of the deal. And... and, and and Sarah said, get rid of the bondwoman. you got to get her away from here. And, and we see that Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. And it was just going to get worse and worse. And it, and it continued to get worse and worse. And so, so here's what we have. The question is, how is the difference between the covenant of Abraham? What, how is the difference between the cover, covenant of Abraham and Moses? And similar to the difference between the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant. And so here's what we have in, in the covenant with Abraham. He had two children. He had one by flesh and one by promise. And God's plan was to, to uh, use the child of promise for his covenant. And, and so the difference is flesh versus faith, right? Right? So he's, he's drawing a similarity now between Moses and, and the new covenant. Because what's the, what is the covenant of Moses all about? It's about what you do, right? Follow these commands. It is about your flesh. Because your flesh has got to follow these commands. And, and what is the new covenant about? Faith, right? And so that's why he's comparing these two different things. You got flesh versus faith there, and you got flesh versus faith now. And that's why he's comparing these Jews to the 
to the, and they would be absolutely offended by what Paul's saying. Because Paul is equating the Jews to the to the Egyptian bond slave woman and their son. And because and the point is because the Jews are now they're they're the ones that are operating in the flesh, and Jesus is saying we operate in faith. Now does that does that make sense of how he used that old testament? Anybody need any more clarification on that? That's kind of one of them deals he's making a point, but you got to go back and look at why is he using this to make the point. All right. Somebody read chapter 5, 1 through 4. Back in Galatians. That's a powerful uh, message that people get really twisted up. Let's kind of go back through all of that. Uh, first of all, uh, what liberty do born-again believers have? No more law. No more law. Uh, that doesn't mean that we just live however we want to live, uh, but we're no longer bound by the rules and regulations of the law. Uh, we're under grace. And man, praise God. Isn't, isn't it awesome that we don't have to live under that law? Now, there's a lot of people trying to get, get back under that thing. And it says, uh, do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. I talked about this last week. Let me tell you what. And, and, and we need to be living holy lives. Uh, we, need to, we need to live in holiness. Uh, but it's so easy. Our flesh just... Our flesh gets us when we're doing bad, and our flesh gets us when we're doing good. Because you start doing good, and you start living right, and, and, and living in holiness, and changing the way you talk, and the way you act, and the way you do business, and all of those things, and, and, and you're communing with God, and then the next thing you know, when you make a mistake, you feel severed from the Lord, and you're like... Well, man, I, I messed that up. I, 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 you know, I can't get back there. And then, and then, and then your 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 flesh will play a trick on you. And then they'll say, "Well, if you just do these things, then you'll be all right with God." What what are, whatever those good things are. Read your Bible, go to church, pray, do this, do that. And then you're then you're in this bondage that says, "I've got to start. I got to do all these things in order to have the love of Jesus." And then you're in bondage again, and so it's it's a fine line. Does that does that make sense? It's a fine line. We 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 need to live in holiness, but we need to understand our mind. It's not our living in holiness that keeps us connected to God. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Okay, let, verse three. Let me read that again. I've got a question on verse three. I, I testify again, every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. And the question is, how does verse 3 condemn Seventh-day Adventist and the Hebrew Roots movement and, 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 and the holiness movements and all of those things that are trying to go back under the law? Here's how. You can't follow the law of Moses anymore. The temple is gone. If you want to follow the, these people that try to keep kosher and they want to follow the law of Moses as a, a part of their a relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you know when you take the Passover, you know where you got to eat it at? Anybody? Huh? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now you got to pack your bags and fly to Israel and take the, the, the Passover in Jerusalem. And, and so these people, uh, whether it be Seventh-day Adventists or whether it be Hebrew Roots folks and all that, that keep kosher, uh, they don't eat pork and they don't eat shellfish and all this stuff, and they observe all the Jewish feasts and they worship on Saturday and not Sunday, they're not following the law of Moses. 
They're following parts of it. They picked and chose the parts they want to follow, or, or just like the Jews, whenever the temple, they pick and choose the parts they can. Because there's no, God didn't leave you an option. God didn't leave the Jews an option. Whenever you had Rome come and destroy the temple, you had to take a choice. You're either going to follow Jesus or you're going to go your own way because they had to rewrite Judaism after the temple was gone. And you have rabbinic Judaism, not Mosaic Judaism. And so he's saying the same thing here. It says, he is a debtor to keep the whole law, all 613 commands. And so if you're going to keep a part of the law, you've got to keep it all. It's not going to do you any good at all. And it says, you have become estranged from Christ to you who attempt to be justified by the law. Our sister was talking about fellowship. What is estrangement? Don't mean you've lost your salvation. You've lost your fellowship because you no longer think that your just your righteousness comes from Jesus. You think your righteousness comes from following whatever rules and regulations these guys are telling you need to follow. It's no yes, ma'am. When you get in under the law, it makes you feel good in the flesh. Yeah, yeah, because you're in control. What makes you fall. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you have an element of control. It's about what you do. Right. You're doing good. But you're really not controlling nothing. And so, so you're estranged from Christ. You've lost your fellowship with Christ. And then, boy, this, this other thing is really disturbing. Um, where it says, you have fallen from grace. Now, you people that believe you can lose your salvation, they, they, say, they think that means you've lost your salvation. You've fallen out of grace. Does it say you fell out of grace? What's it say? You fell from grace. It, so you were living in grace. You were living in liberty. You weren't in bondage. Jesus had set you free. You weren't following the, uh, the law. You were, you were living in this grace. This is the reality. And then you fell away from that and you put yourself back under the law. You didn't have to be. You're still in grace. That's the reality of it. Uh, uh, you're still there. You're just choosing to not follow and not live in that grace that God. And so it's not you've fallen uh, out of grace. In other words, you're lost. Now you're doomed to hell. No, you've fallen from grace. Do what? You're in a fellowship at that moment. Yeah, right. And, uh, and it's a miserable place to be. I'm going to tell you what. The most miserable you can be. If you're here, and I know some of you here have known the Lord a long time, there have been periods of time in your life that you were trying to earn God's uh, love by what you did. And it is the most miserable thing. There's no peace in that. You just got to rest in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, do the best you can, ask forgiveness and repent when you sin, and keep on going. That's where peace comes from. That's where peace comes from. Well, for them, for, for they, the, the Jewish teachers were trying to get them to become circumcised, which would then would then take take away God's grace for their own actions. Yeah. And yeah. then they would be bound to follow the law because they were circumcised. Yeah, and they couldn't. And that's what Paul's point was. You can't. You gotta follow it all. If you're gonna go the way of the law, you gotta follow it all. And 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 we don't have the ability to do that. And so uh I know it's, it seems like Paul's beating a dead horse here in this in this book of Galatians, but we're all susceptible to that. We're all susceptible to putting ourselves back under a law. Maybe not the law of Moses, but back under a law that says, if I just do these things, if I check these boxes, then I'm going to stay saved. If I check these boxes, God's going to love me. If I check these boxes, I'm going to find favor. Now look. If you're, if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you're a child of the living God, an heir according to the promise, and just put keep your faith and trust in Jesus and, and not in the things that you do.